Welcome to the fourth uh, meeting of the Humanities Forum in the uh, spring 2020 semester. My name is Dr. Alexander Moffat. I'm director of the Development of Western Civilization program here at Providence College. Just a reminder, the Humanities Forum, um, meet, we have a different invited speaker uh, every week, and everyone is invited to attend these wonderful events. Uh, next week, we start a three-week uh, three series on Shakespeare uh, with Dr. Timothy Burns of Baylor University, who's going to be giving a presentation on Shakespeare's political wisdom. So um, please uh, uh, join us for th that event and for the ones that follow it. It promises to be a really excellent series. I'd like to introduce right now uh, Dr. Adrienne Weimer, Associate Professor of History here at Providence College, and she will be introducing this afternoon's speaker. Dr. Weimer. Thank you, Dr. Moffat. Thank you, all of you, for being here on Valentine's Day. And uh, I can promise you that uh, the story you're going to hear today from the renowned scholar and historian Karen Kupperman would not fit well on a Hallmark card. Um, <laughs> but uh, I can't tell you how thrilled I am that she's here. I could list her many books. I want to, you to know the names of a few of them so that you get a sense of the range of her scholarship. The Atlantic in World History, uh, an edition of Richard Ligon's True and Exact History of the Island of Barbados, Indians and English Facing Off in Early America, which won the prestigious American Historical Association's Prize in Atlantic History. And I have to say, this one's my favorite, Providence Island, 1630 to 1641, The Other Puritan Colony. <laughs> also a prize-winning book, uh, won the, Alf the Albert Beveridge Award. And um, it's an honor and a delight to introduce Karen Kupperman, who's been both a mentor and a role model for uh, several generations of scholars, and particularly women scholars. And um, I think it's appropriate that she's speaking on Valentine's Day because she is so deeply hum humane in her scholarship. She sees the historical actors she studies as human beings, not as uh, angels and demons or heroes and villains, but as full-orbed human beings. And so I'm delighted now to welcome her to speak today on Double Agents in Early Virginia. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kupperman. England's Jamestown colony barely made it through its first decade after it was planted in Virginia in 1607. The colonists were able to get through those terrible first years in large part because both the English and the natives deployed youths to make connections that adults could not. The swaggering captains and the powerful Indian leaders uh, were important and they made most of the decisions but a lot of those decisions were bad, especially on the English side. And it was the kids who smoothed over or who tried to smooth over the cracks. Everyone involved in Atlantic Enterprises exchanged young people, usually boys. And I've come to think of the Atlantic as an area of self-invention. If you weren't able to keep reinventing yourself and your persona, you probably didn't make it. You certainly don't appear in the records. Uh, and so these four young people that I'm talking about uh, were involved in this constant process of reinvention. So, uh, and I'm arguing that they're the most important people in early Virginia. So, uh, Pocahontas, the daughter of the Poetan, who was a paramount chief who had many tribes as clients under him, collectively known as the Poetans, was 10 or 11 when Jamestown was founded. So this is, I wanted to, to digress for a moment and say something about images. 
Because one of the things that makes it very frustrating to work on the early English colonies is that English people did not draw. There's a, think about it. There's nothing from Boston, early Boston. There's nothing from Providence. There's nothing from Jamestown. Sir Walter Raleigh sent a young scientist and an artist to his Roanoke colony. And all the images that we have come from that. So, and, and this one I think is particularly interesting because the, the, we have the painting done by John White and then the engraving that was made from it by a, a German engraver who had, of course, never been to America. And all the, all the engravings I'm going to show you from now on are done by people who are giving us their idea about what things might have looked like. So, and, and it, I mean, I don't want to go on and on, but to me it's very interesting the kinds of changes that the engraver made. You know, White has long, normal-looking feet, and, and the engraver makes these little tiny feet, and the, he fixes the postures, and, in, you know, it's just, it's, you could spend a lot of time talking about uh, how the engraver engravers change the images. And this is one case where we have the original set of paintings and the, the engravings that were made from them. Mostly we just have the engravings. So uh, she was 10 or 11, as I said, when Jamestown was founded. Uh, she came to Jamestown frequently in the early months. She always, she didn't just, you know, pop in. She always accompanied an embassy of her father's men, and her presence indicated that it was a peaceful mission. So the presence of women on a, any mission uh, that we know of was a sign that, that should not be seen as a hostile. Um, and the English boys were in Jamestown from the very beginning. There were four boys on the first ship, most of these, a lot of times, it'll, the ship's list will just say four boys. They won't even tell us their names. And so a lot of them we never hear of again or very rarely. So Thomas Savage, who's one of the boys I'm talking about, arrived in January 1608 with the first resupply fleet. Uh, after he had been in America less than a month, uh, Captain Christopher Newport, who was the admiral of the fleet and the superior officer any time he was in the colony, handed Thomas Savage to Poetin. He, told, he tried to exaggerate, I think, the significance of his presentation by saying that Thomas Savage was his son. So uh, the native people always called him Thomas Newport. Uh, so, uh, and then Poetin handed back to Newport a young man named Naaman Tack. 14-year-old uh, Henry Spellman came in 1609. The Virginia Company had gotten a new charter and sent a very large fleet in 1609, and this is from a pamphlet that was advertising that new initiative. Uh, Smith, Captain John Smith, gave uh, Henry to Parahunt, who we think was Poetin's son, in exchange for a, a village near Richmond shortly after Henry had arrived, a couple of weeks, I think. And uh, Robert, Robert Poole, arrived in 1611. He actually came with his brother and father. And I think he was, may have been much younger because uh, he didn't actually, he wasn't actually sent to live with a native leader until 1614. So Thomas was 13 when he arrived in 1608. Henry was 14 when he arrived in 1609, and we don't know Robert Poole's ages. So, uh, this is, a, this is a map of Virginia. It's based on the map that Captain John Smith uh, 
created, uh, but this is done by Edward Wright Hale, who has, who has published a collection of all of the Jamestown narratives, an extremely valuable collection, and has created this map uh, up from John Smith's map, cleaned up, in other words. Um, so I wanted to just say a, all, another digression. I wanted to say a word about terminology because it's difficult when you're talking about America's native people. The, the, the best practice is to use tribal names, always use tribal names if you can, if you know them. Uh, and uh, otherwise, so I'm talking about uh, the Poetans who lived on the James River, which is the southernmost, this map is tilted, the southernmost of the rivers flowing into Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and and uh, the Pamunkeys were part, were, were Poetans' native tribe, but they were part of the Poetan Empire. Um, so, and one of the boys, Thomas Savage, ultimately moves to the Accomacs, Accomacs on the eastern shore. So the southern, or I guess it would be the western part of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so the, uh, we often use the term Algonquian to describe the natives of the east coast. Algonquian is a language group. It's like Romance languages, say. Uh, and so all the native people all up and down the coast of, of uh, North America spoke Algonquian languages, but we're not referring to any kind of political grouping if you use that kind of terminology to refer to these people. Um, and of course, all of the sources are written by English people. They sometimes quote Natives, but they're you know it's their these are all written for to be sent back to England for propaganda purposes essentially. Uh, I mean, I once compared them to freshman letters home from college. There's everything is just about to get really good, and please send money. You know, it's sort of it's the same thing uh, with these letters home. But one of the things that has dramatically changed our understanding of the writings is archaeology, which has been practiced in the East really only for the last three or so decades. And so we now understand a lot. We read the documents differently because we understand a lot more from the archaeology. So that's just about the sources that we have. So the records tell us nothing about Thomas's origins or who decided he would go to America at the age of 13. We do know about Henry Spellman partly because he wrote a memoir of his experiences with the Poetans and the Potomacs. Uh, and this is the first page of his memoir. Uh, and we also know about him because he, he was a member of a very distinguished family. His father, his, sorry, his uncle, Sir Henry Spellman, was a member of parliament. He was a founding member of the Society of Antiquaries. And uh, so I think it's Sir Henry's influence that probably got Henry to write down his experiences in America. You can see that he starts his memoir by saying, being in displeasure of my friends and desirous to see other countries. Uh, whatever he had done that brought him into the displeasure of his family, which is what he meant by friends, uh, might have been some pretty serious, I think. And so his influential uncle probably arranged for him to get a place on this fleet, this large fleet that was going to Virginia in 69. Uh, to get him out of the way, you know, so that he couldn't be punished if he had done something uh, really seriously wrong. So I think Jamestown's disastrous first years stemmed largely from the casual way they planned their colonies. Uh, they, all the early colonies were made up exclusively of young men, mostly with military experience, or certainly led by people with military experience. 
Uh, and in Europe, soldiers always lived off the land, as they put it, wherever they were. So they naturally assumed that the, these colonists would be fed by the native people. But living on hun handouts from the natives in Virginia was going to be really tough. For one thing, uh, Poetin and the other leaders had seen a lot of Europeans over the years, and and they knew what they knew how to handle Europeans in 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 one way, and um, so they weren't going to just hand over everything that they had to the colonists. It was it became a real struggle, but also we now know from archaeology, from tree ring studies, that. The region was in year two of the most disastrous seven-year drought of the, of the previous 770 years. So the native food supplies were under extreme pressure already, much less having to feed, you know, 100 whining Englishmen. So, okay, this is, I mentioned that Poetin gave uh, Captain Newport, a young man named Naaman Tack. I, I don't think either of these people, you can see their names, they're not Naaman Tack, but they're representative of the kinds of depictions that were made of Virginians who went to London. This is a, a lottery uh, ad that the Virginia Company was authorized to have in order to finance the project. Um, so name and tack, uh, the English thought that, that Poetin had given them name and tack in order to spy on them. But of course, that's partly because they were doing the same thing by putting Thomas Savage and Henry Spellman in native communities. Uh, he sailed back to England uh, with Captain Newport. Poetin later said that he purposely sent him to King James his land to see him in his country and to return me the true report thereof. Uh, I think all, all around the Atlantic, but certainly in Virginia, leaders on both sides understood that youth could cross uh, boundaries that an adult could not cross. It's clear from Henry's memoir that he was able to see intimate details of life that no, you know, a Captain John Smith would never have been able to see. But they also, I think, thought that, that uh, young kids were in a transitional state of life. Uh, there's a character in Shakespeare who says that youth are doughy and unbaked. And uh, there another writer, Sir William Vaughan, said, Youth is like unto moist and soft clay. So they could adapt, they could learn, language, learn languages that uh, adults would have a much harder time learning. And I am convinced that at least for the English, they were also expendable. So we can talk about that more later if you want to in the Q&A. Uh, so their job, the boys' job, was to learn the culture from the inside, and especially to learn the language so that they could interpret. But each language involves a different way of looking at the world. And especially if you think about languages so different as Chesapeake Algonquian and English of the 17th century. So in, according to, this is from, oh, sorry, I'm getting behind myself. Uh, this is a, a slide of Henry interpreting. He's, I think he wasn't, again, remember what I said about the guys in, back in Europe who are making these engravings, as he has Henry sort of laying down the law, which I kind of think was not the way it was done. But anyway, uh, so on the interpretation, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, at, in this period, the word traduce meant both to interpret and to betray. And so I think a betrayal is an integral part of interpretation. You can never make a one-for-one -one rendering of a word from one language into another or a concept. And so uh, 
they were they were actually doing, I think, an impossible job. So Pocahontas and Naaman Tack and Thomas Henry and Robert spent the rest of their lives caught between cultures. They were the only people who could, who could understand the goals of all sides. Uh, and they often faced, I think, really hard choices. They knew they were being used. Both sides sometimes sent them with false information or false invitations. Uh, but they also cared about the outcomes. So because they were kids, they had no control o over what was going on. But they understood the stakes, I think, better than anyone. So Pocahontas's first engagement came uh, with the colonists came just a few weeks into Jamestown's life when Captain John Smith was brought as a captive into the presence of the Poetan. Uh, Smith said he was dragged to two great stones and was forced to lay his head down on them. And then these huge men with clubs approached and he was sure they were going to beat out his brains. But then Pocahontas came forward and put her head on his and her father relented, according to Smith's account. So uh, he, Smith said Pocahontas was his dearest daughter. Oh, okay. And he could not refuse her pleas. In reality, we think that this was a, an adoption ceremony. He's being, the, the Englishman is being killed and the, the new Indian man is being brought forth. And the reason, the, the relative sizes are, I don't know if there's an art historian here, but we could talk about that later since uh, this is Otamatamakan, the chief priest. Um, Two days later, Poetin called Smith into his presence and he, he gave him a name. He said he was now his son, Nantaquad. He gave him a village to govern and he also gave him a list of things he wanted from Jamestown, including two cannons and uh, a grindstone. And he said that he would forever esteem him as his son. So uh, one of the interesting things I think about all these, these uh, uh, accounts is how often they use kinship terms to describe what's going on. Uh, in May 1608, Poetin angrily sent Thomas Savage back to Jamestown because the English were holding several of his men captive. And as, almost as soon as he arrived, Pocahontas came right after him, asking for him to return and saying that, Poca, that Poetin loved him exceedingly. So, and Poetin later referred to Thomas as my child. I think the fictive kinship was also a strategy. It's a way of, of making certain kinds of relationships and, and then those can be used in different ways in the future. Uh, so I wanted to say when we were talking, about, when I was talking about uh, these, these kinship relationships and the relationships within the Poetin paramount chiefdom. This, this is uh, in the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. It's, it's called Poetin's Mantle. There's an account when uh, Poetin is, they later bring a crown and a red cloak for him. And, the, and the, in the account, they say he took off his cloak and handed it to the English. But this has clearly never been worn. It's not a cloak. And we now think it's a map. There are Indian maps from the 18th century southeast that have been discovered and analyzed. And so the, this is not a map of terrain, it's a map of relationships. So each of the circles represents people who are part of Poetin's chiefdom and the relationships between them. And uh, the, 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 it's a deer hide and it has shell, the, the circles are made of shells. So I've seen one from the 18th century southeast where they have circles. It's drawn on, a, on parchment. 
And then over in the corner are two rectangles labeled South Carolina and Virginia. You know, so the, the, this is a map of, of the poet and polity, which I think is important to uh, talk about because it's so different from the European, you know, hierarchical mode of association. So the colonists' constant demands for food and their reprisals, if they, if they believed they were being challenged in any way, became too much. And so uh, uh, in, at the beginning of, well, during 1609, Poetin moved his capital away from Werowocomico. Werowocomico was on the York River, which is just above the James, and it was at about the same place on the, where, on the York River as Jamestown was on the James. But he moved his capital. You can see, uh, here's Jamestown down here, Werowocomico. He moved it to Oropax. So here at Werowocomico, the river is broad. You can get, easily get there with ships and this kind of thing. Oropax, not so much. <laughs> so, and Thomas went with him. This is the other thing that I think is, uh, an other thing that I think is interesting is that these boys were not free agents. They had been given as tokens and they, they were not free to come and go as they pleased. So Thomas went with him. Uh, uh, actually before the removal, Poetin had sent Thomas to back to Jamestown with a, an invitation to the colonists to come and, and if they came with certain trade items, they would receive food in return. But it was a trap. Pocahontas came in the night and warned them to leave. And, and uh, they did, of course. And then it was that same month that Poetin moved his capital to Oropax. And I think this is important because what I have wondered is whether uh, Poetin is also using Pocahontas and her relationship with the, with the English because he makes these threats and then Pocahontas intervenes and, and the threat is not carried out. So it may be a kind of way of convincing the English that their situation is precarious while at the same time keeping the, the relationship somewhat alive. Uh, so w once he moved to Oropax, Pocahontas quit visiting Jamestown. Uh, Thomas came with, a, with some men, with some food, and he said, he told the leaders at Jamestown that he was loath to return to Oropax on his own. And so they uh, told Henry to go with him. And Henry said he was happy to do that because victuals were scarce with us. You know, the food shortage was so great and growing. Uh, so, and one of, again, Henry says in his memoir that he, uh, he took with me some copper and a, and a hatchet, which I had gotten. So he understood how these relationships are created by this time, even though he'd only been here for a short while. But life at Oropax was uncomfortable. Uh, Thomas and Henry, I think, became rivals for Poetin's attention rather than allies. So after Henry had been there about three weeks, Poetin sent him to Jamestown with a false message. Uh, and after that, that one resulted in many deaths, many English deaths. Uh, and so he wrote, the king in show made still much of us, yet his mind was much declined from us, which made us fear the worst. So a Potomac, leader from the Potomac, so the, the topmost river flowing into the Chesapeake Bay, visited Poetin at Oropax, and he invited Henry and Thomas to go back with him to the Potomac. And they agreed, that another a man, a, a German carpenter who had been sent to build a house for Poetin, 
accompanied them, and as they were going, suddenly Thomas left and went back and told Poetin what was going on. And so Poetin sent men after them. Thomas, one of them killed Thomas with a hatchet, and then Henry, you know, in typical young kid style says, and I made my way by myself up to the Potomac. <laughs> uh, Captain John Smith later said, this is another example of what I was talking about, that Pocahontas had actually intervened to save his life. So again, the show of force, but then not the, the final, you know, carrying out of the threats. Uh, so in this year, this is the beginning of 1610, every, all three lives changed completely. Uh, Poetin decided that Pocahontas was at an age where she should be married. Uh, and so he married her to a person, uh, they called him a private captain named Coquam. Private and public are very important words, and we'll see this in a few minutes. Uh, Henry lived with Yapazus for a year, almost a year, uh, as a member of the family, really. He said, none could quiet the chief's baby as well as myself. So he was kind of like an au pair, I think, or something in the household. Uh, and, and at the same time, Poetin sent Thomas back to Jamestown. Thomas had lived with Poetin for three years. And again, to me, it's interesting to think about, although I don't think there's a clear answer, but he could have used, he could have kept Thomas as a hostage, but instead he sent him away, just told him to go back to Jamestown. Uh, and so that was the end. There, that was his last tie with the English colonists that had been severed by this act of send, sending Henry back. And William Strachey, who was in the colony uh, and wrote uh, his account of events once back in England, included what he called an angry song that the poetans circulated after Thomas had been sent back. And he said that these song described how they killed the English for all our pocket sacks, that is our guns, even though Captain Newport brought them copper. And they could hurt Thomas Newport for all his monocoque, that is his bright sword, and could capture Simon for all his tomahawk, that is his hatchet. The refrain, hui, hui, was the English crying as they were killed and uh, which they mocked us for and cried again to us, ya ha ha, to Wittawa, to Wittawa, to Wittawa. So, uh, however much Poetin had valued Thomas, he was English and on the other side and the relationship was finished. So now that he was back in Jamestown, he became the principal interpreter for the English. Captain Samuel Argyle came into the Potomac at Christmas time, 1610. As usual, he was mainly looking for corn for the colonists, but also he had heard that a boy named Harry was living among the Potomacs. And so after the ship had been anchored several days, Yapazus and Henry came on board Argyle's ship. It was Christmas Eve. Yapazus saw an Englishman reading a Bible, and he wanted to know what was in the book. And so uh, Argyle opened it to the uh, picture of Adam and Eve in the creation story at the beginning, and had Henry explain the creation of the world in, uh, according to the Christian Bible to Yapazus. And then Yapazus explained his creation story and what happened to people after death. So after all this, then, according to Henry, Captain Argyle gave the king some copper for me. Thus was I set at liberty and brought into England. Uh, so Argyle, first he went back to Jamestown, then Argyle sailed for England in March 1611, and Henry, Henry accompanied him. So here I'm going into speculation again. Uh, while 
1611, while Henry was in London, Shakespeare's Tempest was, was, had its first performance. And, and I think it's widely believed now that uh, the storm with which the uh, uh, play opens was based on William Strachey's account in a letter he sent home of the storm that they had endured. Strachey was among the, uh, Strachey was on the flagship which was wrecked on Bermuda and in which the colonists, the intended colonists returned to a state of nature. So there are a lot of echoes of uh, that experience in the Tempest. Henry and Henry's ship, the Unity and most of the others did finally make their way to Jamestown, but nobody knew that this group on Bermuda had actually survived until they were able to make some boats and get to Jamestown. So uh, I, I like to think that Henry saw uh, a performance of The Tempest. <laughs> um, William Strachey was also back in London at this time, so he also, you know, could have seen it. He lived in the Blackfriars, and it was performed in the Blackfriars Theater, as Strachey did. Uh, so, and I think that, you know, the, it's, a, it's, it's interesting to me to imagine, you know, when Caliban says the aisle is full of noises, you know, how that would have resonated with uh, Henry and, and Strachey. And of course, in the play it also says, Trinculo says, in England, though they will not give a doit to relieve a lame beggar, they will lay out 10 to see a dead Indian. So there's a, there's a lot in the play that it's, uh, it was interesting for me anyway to think about Henry and Strachey sitting there seeing it. So Henry returned to Virginia then when Argyll sailed back in 1612. Pocahontas had been away since the move to Oropax, but she returned to Jamestown now in 1613, but the circumstances were very different. Uh, Poetin had sent her with an embassy up to the Potomac. Captain Argyle, again looking for food, came into the Potomac and discovered that she was there. Uh, and he says he resolved to possess myself of her by any stratagem that I could use. He told Yapasus that if he did not betray Pocahontas into my hands, we would no longer be brothers nor friends. So, and this again, the, oh, sorry, this is, yeah, this is it. This is the image done by a European engraver of the capture. And it's, uh, most of these images are pretty stiff, but you can almost feel the emotion from Pocahontas as she's being lured onto the ship and unsure what to, how to respond. And then of course, Yapazus, with his, his horns, his feathers turning, and the tail of his um, garment behind him is clearly portrayed as the devil. His wife has all the loot that they got for betraying Pocahontas under her arm. So this, it seems to me, is a classic example of blame the victim. Uh, I mean, Pocahontas is the real victim here, but Yabazus was forced to do something that he desperately did not want to do. And then this is how it becomes translated into English culture. So when Pocahontas now in, London, in, in uh, Jamestown, uh, she is uh, educated in Christianity by a young Puritan minister named Reverend Alexander Whitaker. He, was, he had just arrived. His father was the Regis Professor of Divinity at Cambridge. Uh, and I think maybe the personal relationship that Puritanism could offer might have made the, what he was teaching her more palatable because it might have been closer to what she knew from her own religious traditions. John Rolfe, also a Puritan, played a crucial role in this process of uh, conversion. He fell deeply in love with Pocahontas and wanted to marry her. 
He wrote that his heart and best thoughts are and have been a long time so entangled and enthralled in so intricate a labyrinth that I, I was even a weary to unwind myself there out. Uh, and he said, God, well, I mean, this is forbidden to uh, Puritans, but he said, God woke him up in the night, pulling me by the ear and saying, why dost thou not endeavor to make her a Christian? In fact, his letter was so impassioned that the Virginia Company had to edit out some of the passages <laughs> before they published it. Uh, so in the period of good feelings that followed the wedding of uh, Pocahontas and John Rolfe in 1614, a new English embassy visited Poetin. Uh, it was led by Ralph Haymore here. I'll explain in the Q&A why Poetin has his hands around his neck. Uh, and um, so Haymore was about to return to England and he says, I wanted to be able to describe the Indians from my own personal experience. So he led this embassy with, Tom, with Henry Spellman interpreting, or uh, sorry, Thomas interpreting. And, and when they approached Poetin, he, he didn't acknowledge Haymore. He turned to Henry, who's the, he's the standing back there and said, my child, you are welcome. You have been a stranger to me these four years. And he also said, you are my child by the donative of Captain Newport. So Poetin told Haymore, I am old and would gladly end my days in peace. And in fact, he would very soon be superseded by a new chief, Opie Kankano. So while in 1614, when Pocahontas was becoming entangled with the English, Robert Poole had been sent to live with Opie Kankano, so he, was now, he now became the principal interpreter. Uh, John Rolfe is credited with growing the first marketable tobacco in an English colony, uh, but I think it was the presence of Pocahontas that allowed him to successfully grow the crop. Uh, he had tried and failed for uh, several seasons before this. Women were the agriculturalists in Chesapeake Algonquian society. Tobacco culture was extremely different from any European crop. So it seems to me that it's not accidental that suddenly in 1614, John Rolfe produces a crop that they can actually market in Europe. Uh, so, and then in 1615, Pocahontas gave birth to John, to Thomas Rolfe, and the Virginia Company decided it was time to send them to England to show off their success. They call this the first fruits, the first convert. And then she's a, not only is she a Christian, but she's the mother of a Christian child. So she was treated as visiting royalty. Uh, it's interesting to me that all the men who went to England are portrayed in native costume. Pocahontas, they, she is a Christian gentlewoman, and, they, and this is part of the success story. She is portrayed this way. Uh, but she, she, she was celebrated while they were in London, uh, but she died as they were leaving sailing down the Thames to return to Virginia. And she's buried at Gravesend on the Thames near the, the English Channel. Uh, she, was, she was 20 years old. So uh, as a result of this successful tobacco crop, the Virginia Company was making major changes as it planned for a new future for Virginia. With an assured source of income, the company wanted to put the colony on a much more secure foundation. And so 400 years ago, in 1619, 1620, they transformed the colony, giving colonists a voice in an elected assembly and encouraging them to work hard by giving them a real stake in the form of land of their own. 
The company also arranged for virtuous young women to come as brides for the planters. There's no point in having land if you don't have anybody to pass it on to. And it, the historiography used to say that these uh, people at the time said these are the sweepings of the streets, they're whores, they're, you know. But in fact, David Ransom, who's sitting there, found the evidence that in fact these were carefully selected women. They, most of them had letters from their priests. They had all, they, they had descriptions of their skills that they, that were put into the record. And so they, the Virginia company was meticulous about sending women who would help to make this the colony that they thought it could be. Hundreds of young English people, mostly men, came as indentured servants, and of course, 1619 also saw the arrival of the first Africans in Virginia. So, this is, uh, we could talk about this later if you want to. This is a kind of satirical ad that was done by uh, actually a student of mine, as if, if, as if Jamestown was a, you know, a, an offering for a condo or a, a resort sort of place. Uh, Here's the ad that the Virginia Company put out, which is, again, you know, it not, has nothing to do with Virginia. It has to do with what people wanted it to look like. So everybody's happy uh, hunting and hawking and fishing and you know, everything's great. So, but the, this huge influx of people was, had been completely unanticipated. The, the poetans had no idea that this kind of thing could happen. Uh, so they were pushed off their land along the rivers. The rivers were the highways in Virginia, and the poetans lost the fertile soil that they had been cul cultivating for many generations because they were pushed back into the interior. The boys who had been go-betweens were now men, and po uh, Robert, who had been barely noticed earlier, was now the principal interpreter with Opie Kankano. Uh, so Thomas dealt with the new realities by, as I said before, moving to the eastern shore. He formed a firm friendship with the chief of the Accomacs, whom the English called the Laughing King, his Esme Shechans. Uh, but I think Henry really didn't know where he stood. He was no longer the principal interpreter. He didn't have a base such as Thomas had. Uh, he had achieved the rank of captain, I think, largely through the action of his uncle. But he was a private actor now and no longer an official interpreter. So the tensions came to a climax in the, first, in the meeting of the first General Assembly. On its final day, it turned itself into a court to hear treason charges against Henry Spellman brought by Robert Poole. 19th century fantasies. <laughs> Robert testified that Henry had used a ruse to get Opikankano to ask him to come and see him. That image where Poet has his hands around Ralph Haymore's neck what he's looking for is a chain that every official ambassador is supposed to be wearing. That's how they would know whether it was somebody who had just said, I'm coming to tell you something, or whether they were official ambassador. And Henry no longer had any official status. So Robert said he'd used a ruse to get Opikankano to invite him. And then in a private conference, Henry told Opikankano that a greater governor Sir Robert Rich would soon replace the current one, and Henry would be Rich's right-hand man. Then Henry said to Robert in English that he would give 40 pounds my lord were come, for then he would trample upon all his enemies. And of course, I think the people sitting in the assembly probably included many of the people that Henry considered his enemies. Uh, when the sentence was passed on him by the he was convicted of treason uh, and sentenced to serve the colony as, a, as an interpreter for seven years. So he was, he was pushed down. 
He was now again a public person because he was an official interpreter. But it seems to me that this is a pretty good indicator of how ridiculous in one way the uh, Jamestown situation was. Here's a man whom you have convicted of treason and you're putting relationships with the natives in his hands. So it shows how, how pressed I think they were. When the sentence was passed on him, Henry, as one that had in him more of the savage than of the Christian, muttered certain words to himself, neither showing any remorse for his offenses, nor yet any thankfulness to the assembly for their so favorable censure. Secretary John Pory wrote that they could only hope he might redeem himself, God's grace not wholly abandoning him. And then the, the colony's leaders soon had concerns about Robert Poole. In January 1620, both Rolfe and John Pory wrote to Virginia Company leader Sir Edward Sandys with disturbing news about Robert. Whereas Governor Yardley was now inclined, according to Rolfe, to see Henry's transgressions as stemming from childish ignorance, Henry was 25, uh, Robert seemed to be deliberately manipulating the colony's relationship with Opikankano and had even turned heathen and was proving very dishonest. They thought he was playing both ends against the middle and Opikankano, who also now accused and condemned Robert and believed that he had sought all the means he could to break our league. So uh, Europeans were concerned about people of dubious identity in their midst. They, in England, they were concerned about conversos, Jews who were outwardly Christian, but who knew what their, their inner reality was. They, they feared uh, Catholics in their midst, in their midst. Uh, and, and they also were very concerned, one of the big concerns of the 17th century was the thousands of Europeans who were captured in the Mediterranean and who had uh, become Muslim and then were repatriated back to Europe. So I think this is the context in which the Jamestown's leaders were looking at Robert and Henry in this sense of, of how do you know what, what is really in their minds. Uh, they decided not to call Robert Poole to account. We counted him a public and as it were a neutral person. So these words public and private are very interesting in this. And at exactly the same time uh, in New England, the Plymouth colony, uh, the, the pilgrims were expressing exactly the same doubts about Squanto, their interpreter. Uh, they, were, they believed he was trying to manipulate the relationship between the colonists and the Wampanoags, and that he was deliberately telling the Wampanoags false things about what was going on inside Plymouth, and uh, perhaps also telling the English false things about what the Wampanoags were doing. So relations in America required employing people who knew and understood both sides. But if you truly understood both viewpoints, how could you be strictly sticking to one side? I mean, it's the classic double agent thing, is that double agents have to give information to both sides because they have to be believed by both sides, but then they, they they're also given false information to carry. So, as I said, Thomas became firmly attached to the Eastern Shore. I'm probably way behind on my slides here, sorry. Yeah, this is the kind of thing, the English stage in this period was full of plays about people captured in the Mediterranean who had turned Turk, as they said, so the language about Robert, he turned heathen, you know, it's the same language. And uh, so this is my favorite image. This is, a por this is called the rainbow portrait of Queen Elizabeth. It's called that because she's holding a rainbow. Uh, but you can see her dress is covered with eyes and ears. And there are, there are 
several theories about what those eyes and ears mean, but the one that is prominent that I favor is that they represented all of her spies all over England who were reporting back from the provinces about what was going on, secretly reporting back. So, uh, so here again, I just wanted, again, the, the uh, Eastern Shore is where Henry was. There's still a site there called Savage Neck, which was part of his property. He kept sending, even though he was living on the Eastern Shore and is away from all the drama at Jamestown, he kept sending back information to the leaders in Jamestown. Uh, but the closer he became to the Accomax, the more doubtful the authorities were about trusting him. So just a couple of years after Henry's trial, uh, and their growing distrust about Robert caused the leadership to make a disastrous mistake. The Laughing King informed Thomas that Opakankano had asked for a poison that grew on the eastern shore and also that he was planning a massive attack on the colonists. The colonial leadership thought maybe the Laughing King was trying to manipulate them by spreading this rumor Maybe Thomas was <laughs> trying to manipulate them. In any case, they ignored it. And on the morning of March 22nd, 1622, Good Friday, uh, the uh, Poetans attacked all of the plantations at once. And it was, uh, the numbers are disputed, but one of the early sources said 350 or so colonists were wiped out. So here again, this is, a European's fantasy about it. Uh, despite his strong, strong ties in the region, or maybe because of it, Henry was killed in the fighting that followed the, the uh, great attack, and he was killed up on the Potomac. Um, colonist Peter Arundel wrote, we ourselves have taught them how to be treacherous by our false dealings. Spellman's death is a just revenge but it is a great loss to us for that captain was the best linguist of the Indian tongue of this country. And as, uh, Henry was 28 when he died. So Thomas and Robert lived on into adulthood. Robert took up the land that he and his father and brother had accrued at Newport News. Thomas was safe on the Eastern shore living on the thousands of acres the Laughing King had given him. By 1624, he had a wife named Hannah and a son, John. Captain John Smith published his grand history of all the colonies in 1624, and he said that Thomas, with much honesty and good success, hath served the public without any public recompense. So that's, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I want to get this picture off. Let's have this. You can read it if you want to. <laughs> All right, we're going to start our Q&A period right now. And as is customary in the Humanities Forum, I'll give precedence to students who have questions. Um, but we welcome questions from anyone. And I'll bring you the mic. Hi, um, I'm Carrie. Um, you had a great talk. Thank um, you. Are you able to go back to the picture of the the, 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 the cloak or whatever it was? Queen Elizabeth? No, um, it's that black. Oh, oh the map. Yeah, the right. map. So are you able to explain like how it showed the relationships between Poetin and... Well, I'm, I'm a little weak on that. I think the maps that I've seen from the early 18th century show the, the circles are larger and smaller. And I don't know about the, you know, the proximity may mean that they're closer to the center of Poetin's concerns and the ones farther out may be less central, but it's, I, I, it's really hard for me anyway to interpret it. it. But it is a social map. I think we're pretty much concerned, con, you know, all, all Everyone agrees that it's, uh, it is a map, but it's a different idea of what a map should be. 
And it's, if you don't mind my saying a bit more, that one of the things that Henry says in his account is that the, the poetan, you know, King James was not the most admirable guy, you know, in his self-presentation. Uh, and Henry says that poetan doesn't dress or live any differently from any of his people. And, but he is set apart by the great honor that they show him and the great dignity that he has in dealing with them. And he talks about how they plant crops for Poetin and they also give him some of their crops in the fall. But he puts them in a storehouse and then he redistributes them back out to the people if, if there's hard times, you know, so that you know, whereas the, the English court was, was, I mean, you saw the Queen Elizabeth. I mean, it was all about aggrandizing money to itself. And so Henry makes a point that I think goes with this map, that it's about these social relationships. It's not about hierarchy and consumption, you know. Sorry, I can't say more about the map. More questions? Hi, thank you. Chris Burrard, Providence College. Um, I was really interested in the Genesis stories, where there are two different Genesis stories. Do we know anything about uh, how the native responded to the Judeo-Christian Genesis story and then vice versa? Do we know anything about that? Well, of course, that we know, because we only have what the English said. They thought the, uh, I think, uh, the person who wrote it down, William Strachey, said that it was a pretty fabulous tale indeed. You know, the, because they said that uh, the first creation was a woman and by the working of one of the gods, she bore children and then they uh, planted, uh, you know, children. In fact, I think in Henry's account, it's that there's a, uh, God, one of the gods takes a deer, deer hide and takes all the hairs off it and places them all over the world. And every, every what do you call it on a deer hide? <laughs> every uh, thread becomes a, a man and a woman. And uh, that's what they thought was. And then the, in the afterlife, and this is also Thomas Harriet, who I mentioned was at Roanoke, has a very similar account, that when you die, you go to uh, a place in the south, west, you travel along this path that's lined with fruit trees and, and all these, uh, there's a place where you stop, where you're fed, and then you end up in the other world where you see all the people who ever lived, and you live your life there, and then when you become an old person there, then you're brought back into this world. So it's a cycle of life and rebirth. Always ready for the human interest story here. Uh, how come Ho Pocahontas died so young, and did she have more than one child? No, she had she had the one child, Thomas. And when she died, Thomas was left behind in Norfolk with John Rolfe's brother. So he didn't come to America until he was in his twenties. He didn't come back to America until he but was. What in his did 20s. she die of? Well, it's a it's a fraught question. Is she? We don't know, uh, is the short answer. She was sick on the ship, and so they stopped at Gravesend and, at Gravesend and took her off. I, you know, I've, I'm retired now, so I'm allowed to speculate in a way that I didn't feel I could when I was, you know, <laughs> still uh, an academic in that way. Uh, they said her lungs had been bothering her. They, the whole Pocahontas party was sent out to Brentford, and I think that was to get them away from the filth and the smoke in London. It may have also been cheaper to keep them there. Uh, but her, uh, I think there were reports that her lungs had been bothering her. And I, I uh, one, there was a man named John Chamberlain whose profession was gathering gossip and sending it in newsletters to people. And he says that they were waiting for a good wind to go back to Virginia 
but it was sore against her will. And uh, so I sort of think that uh, we also know, thanks to the work of David Ransom, that the Virginia Company had been granted, or the, the Virginia Company had raised money all over the country. Every parish had to pony up money. And this money, or at least some of it, was to be used for the conversion of her people. And, and John Rolfe had sworn an oath that he, would, that he and Pocahontas would use this money to convert the Poetans. And so this, with the John Chamberlain sore against her will and this regret about having to do this, there was a previous man in the 1570s named Paki Kineo who had been captured by the Spanish. He spent 10 years with the Spanish, uh, with the Jesuits mainly, and the, he came back to the Chesapeake with a Jesuit mission. And within a few weeks, he led the group that wiped out the mission. And so in my, I'm sorry to be going on so long about this, but this is something I have really struggled with. Because I think to, go, to now be going back, she couldn't, like Paki Kineo, simply turn her back on the English because of the baby. And I, and I think, you know, people said she died of a broken heart, and that's what we call stress-related disease today, although I guess broken heart is sort of coming back after Carrie Fisher and everything. But I think it may have been that the stress of this assignment and the fact that she couldn't get out of it may have added to whatever she was suffering from and whatever disease she was suffering from, and that may have contributed to it. But, I mean, I go back to my first answer, we don't know, you know, <laughs> so. Yes, thank you so much. Um, continuing the, the human interest angle, what were the circumstances that surrounded her marriage and what, were her, what was her father's involvement or blessing, if any? Well, in light of this whole a, double a, agent thesis. That is one that I can actually answer to some extent anyway. That is, uh, again, all we have is what English people wrote down. And they said that she was 100% Christian and that she was 100% for the marriage. Uh, they invited Poetin to come to the wedding, but Henry says in his uh, memoir that, that the Poetin never goes out of his own country. So he refused, to, he refused the invitation, but he gave his blessing, and he sent, according to the records, an old uncle of hers to represent him at the wedding. So again, you know, we don't, we have no native speaker in their own voice saying anything about this. But he may have seen it, you know, as I was saying, speculating about his use of Pocahontas as a fallback sort of device, this, he may have thought this was a good thing to cement the relationship. Uh, I was uh, intrigued by wondering what sort of background these boys had acquired by age 13 when they were plumped into this alien situation. Uh, would they, for example, since that part of the idea was that they should learn this new language, had they been exposed, for example, had they got far enough or got the kind of schooling uh, which would have exposed them to Latin, say? Right. But I uh, added to that uh, uh, the other angle of education, uh, what sort of religious education would they have had? I was struck by the story of Henry going on to Argyll's ship, seeing him reading a Bible and saying, what's that book? No, no, it was the opposites who said, oh. what is, what's in that book? Oh. And Henry who it tried to explain it to him, but of course we don't know what he said. I mean, one of the things I wondered about was how would you translate a word like Lord? 
I mean, the, no, the whole conceptual I mean, framework of Christianity uh, is just out of there, and, and uh, they struggled, obviously. John Eliot struggled, uh, right, but produced right. something. Yeah. What yeah. the Indians made of it, of course. So, you know, so anyway. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. I, uh, Henry was clearly well educated. He was from an eminent family. And I've seen the letter that he wrote to his uncle, which is in this very fancy pamphlet. More educated than Lord. Uh, and I, we have, I have no knowledge at all. No one knows about Thomas or Robert. But presumably they would have been, uh, I mean, the age of confirmation would have been before 13, right? Yeah. <laughs> so presumably they had had a degree of, they'd been to the village school, I would assume, and also had some religious education. But I still think uh, for a 13-year-old to understand some of the more intricate concepts of Christianity, it would have been hard to explain them to someone else and then to take a native religion and try to describe it to Europeans. Uh, Looking for student hands as well, remember. Uh, Nancy Eisenberg suggests that the, this country was, found, was settled not by religious dissidents and other such dignified people, but essentially by rejects from Europe, ranging from criminals to superfluous sons. Uh, does, your, does your picture of what's going on here support that idea? Well, I, I think uh, certainly uh, it, and I was thinking of this in, in response to her question as well. I mean, it was typical in England, uh, people left home when they were 13. And a very, very tiny minority went to one of the universities or went to the Inns of Court to study. Most people became servants in another family's home or business. Apprenticeships were also possible, but they were expensive. You had to pay to become an apprentice. So almost everyone went into servitude. And you changed masters every year. Uh, and, and you were in servitude until you could set up on your own, which could have been very long into your 20s. The estimates that I've seen are for men, it was around 26. And for women, 24, 25. So this was the educational system, really, of England. You learned, you were supposed to have learned a skill. You were supposed to maybe have learned to read and write in the, if you didn't already know. So I think the, uh, what, what scholars have argued is that the people who, were, who went, to, oops, <laughs> went to Virginia or New England as indentured servants were basically on this servitude track. And so it was just the next step because uh, Alan McFarlane, who's a very of Peter Stuart England, says the reason there is no prohibition of cousin marriage in England is because your the chances of your meeting your own cousin were almost <laughs> nil because you you moved every year and you got farther and farther away from your center. So that's how I think of these people. They weren't. I mean, later on they did send. Uh, convicts and people like that. But in these early years, I think they were, they were people who, you know, this was just the next, next servitude that they went into. The trouble, the difference, of course, was that because of the cost of sending someone here, you had to, you had to serve seven years. Whereas previously in the English situation, you, you signed up for a year and then you could move on. At the, the, and the signing contracts was done at the big agricultural fairs at the end of the summer. So the servants could all get together and say, don't go with that guy. He's terrible. He doesn't give you enough to eat. And of course, the masters also could discuss uh, previously. But it was very rare for someone to stay in servitude for more than a year. So this was a, and this is why this word non-age also really 
interest because, um, you know, it's a, uh, it's also like dotage. I mean, it, you're not really a full member of the society if you're in this, you're in this, you're dependent of your natal household and then being able to set up your own. So I, I don't know whether that answers your question or get some distance toward answering it. That was terrific. So I, I uh, had a question. You, you raised the dichotomy between public and private, and I come across this language a lot oh, in my own work right. where they're talking about pr public spiritedness as a certain kind of civic quality, um, but it also has certain kinds of obligations attached. And I'm wondering if you wanted to say more about that, the public captain versus the private or the linguistic um, service that that implied, or uh, I'd love to hear you speak more to that. Well, I, I, it still kind of puzzles me, you know, because at first I didn't think much of it, you know, and then I kept seeing it in these contexts where it clearly was a very important distinction to leaders. And so I think uh, when Henry, I mean, what the, what the Virginia Company, when they record Henry's sentence, they say that he was degraded. So, you know, he becomes a public person, but he's also degraded. In so I'm, I, I would love to hear what you think about it, because I, I find it sort of puzzling. And as I say, the first, when I first encountered it, I didn't think much of it. And, and then when you start, it's the way you, history always is, when you, you start seeing it everywhere. <laughs> uh. Thank you. Um, so I find this whole fascinating, the idea of the youth being so important for uh, the, this diplomacy. Um, of course, the, them being pliable is also problematic. You talk about them you know, turning heathen and um, the problems of them going over. Um, so I, I, I'd be really interested in how, how they, rea they work with that. But I was wondering if, do we see this in other communities and other encounters between different Native American tribes and uh, colonists coming over or in other um, encounters? Is this unique to the Jamestown experience or can we, can we find this in other examples in other places? It actually happens all around the Atlantic. Uh, you know, the first Portuguese ship to, that went to Brazil in 1500 carried 20, they called them degradados, uh, and, and the plan was to leave one at every place they stopped, you know. And I mean, one of my favorite examples is a French boy. There were two Huguenot attempts uh, to found colonies on the coast of Carolina in the 16th century. And in one case, a boy is left, a 15-year-old boy is left behind. His name is Guillaume Ruffin, and then he is taken up by some Guale Indians, and so he becomes Guale. He actually marries within the, that people. And then he's captured by um, the Spanish, so he becomes Guillermo Rufino. And you know, he's, I mean, that's why I said at the beginning, I think the people who make it are the ones who, who whatever is going on, I will shape myself in some way to deal with that. So. And Martin Frobisher, who led three expeditions up to the Baffin Island area in search of gold in the 1570s, he had been left on the coast of Africa as a 15-year-old. So it's happening all over. Uh, and in fact, one of the interesting stories that I would like to pursue more is, uh, I think, four, maybe five, Japanese boys who were taken by Jesuits to Rome and lived in, for many years in, in Europe and then returned to Japan and had different outcomes when they got back to Japan. But this, this was a constant process. Hi, um, I'm Samantha, thank you for coming. 
Um, I know you sort of touched on this earlier, but um, I was just wondering, were the colonists in Jamestown able to successfully convert other natives or native women to Christianity, or was Pocahontas kind of just their poster child and their only success story? Poster child. And I think, <laughs> I mean, one of the things that I think, you know, now I'm going to go into my preaching mode, <laughs> But you know the 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 uh, in the 16th century, uh, the Dutch and the English created this propaganda theme called the Black Legend, the idea that the Spanish were so rapacious in their treatment of the Indians, and that that the Protestants would bring true religion. And the Protestants talk a lot about it, but they don't actually do much. Uh, whereas, of course, in in, uh, in Florida and Georgia, there were 80 missions by before the 17th century, so that it's it, that's interesting to me because that tends to get erased in the way we teach American history, and you could say that's cultural subversion, you know. So it it but according to their own lights. They were all saying this was important, but it was the Spanish who were really doing it. May I ask a, a, a question? I, I, you know, you you tell this, uh, you know, this 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 milieu of suspicion and distrust yeah, that's yeah. going on in Jamestown with these individuals. And this might this question might be inviting the kind of post-retirement speculation you were talking about <laughs> earlier. But I was wondering, do we have any sense of what the, what the motives of people like Henry and Robert really are? Because it seems to me if you're an interpreter, you've got a great deal of vested interest in sort of peaceful coexistence and trade and communication. And yet here they are being suspected of all these, you know, of, of, of going over to the other side. Do we have a sense of what they hoped their, you know, the, their fates would be or what their aspirations were? Uh. Well, I mean, obviously the only case where I have any concrete evidence is Thomas, who yeah. became a planter. Being on the eastern shore was really good because uh, the tobacco market, you know, was just up and down. I mean, the... the uh, the market was very easily saturated so that the price of tobacco would go would be high and then two years later it would be worth nothing and and you were reliant on these merchants who picked up your tobacco and then they would come back a year later and say oh your tobacco was rotten by the time it got to uh, uh, London so we you know you don't get anything you know whereas the eastern shore got engaged in the provisions trade and so they were uh, selling food all up and down the Atlantic, you know, the uh, Atlantic coast of North America and into the Caribbean once there are colonies there. And so it's a much, much better trade because they see their buyers face to face. They, you know, they, there's not a, a whole year turnaround time. It's a, you know, a few weeks. So he becomes a very successful planter and as in has a child with his his wife paid her own way. So she had 50 acres of her own too. <laughs> so uh, that's as much as I, I mean, I think Henry, you know, when he talks to Opie Kankano about how the Earl of Warwick is going to come and he's going to be at his right hand, you know, and I mean, uh, obviously, it didn't work out, and Warwick never came. And but that I think is a is gives some insight into what he thought he could be if everything worked out. As I said in the book, as he's being shipped off to Virginia, his cousin, the son of of uh, Sir Henry, is is leaving for Cambridge. So it must have been a little painful, you know, to be the one who you go out, probably will never see you again, and the, the his cousin is going to Cambridge at the same time. So, but other than that, it's just very hard to to know, you know, what they thought. And I, I'm not sure people in the 17th century really looked ahead that way. I mean, they took it as it came, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. 
I'd like you to join me in thanking Dr. Karen Kupperman. Thank you so much. And for those who are joining us to dinner, we'll be at the uh, Center of Catholic and, and Dominican Studies at 5.30. Uh, oh, and we have the reception uh, um, right now, so please linger for that. Thank you. <laughs>